all right, let's think about how oh, other ways that we could organize or arrange our social world in terms of gender. So we've spent a while now, oh, raising some concerns about the binary view of gender, right? It seems incorrect to claim that there are only two genders. It also is simply false to claim that there are only two sexes. And as we have seen, there are good reasons to be skeptical of the claim that biological sex is the sort of natural category that exists, in, exists independently of human beings um, and from which gender is produced. It seems like there are some good reasons to think that the relationship between the two is much more complicated than that. Which leaves us at this question of, okay, what do we do with all of that information? Well, in their piece, Why Be Non-Binary, Robin Dembroff talks about non-binary gender identities as having the radical potential to shift and subvert our binary notions of sex and gender. It's not just that non-binary gender identities open up a third gender possibility. That is not what Dembroff is arguing, but rather that once we acknowledge that there aren't only two gender categories, that we don't live in a binary gender world, then the whole system starts to fall apart. And it starts to enable us to ask some really important questions about whether and how gender should play a role in our lives and in our social world. So one of the really important quotes from Dembroff's text has to do with the idea of not wanting gender to be sort of the primary way by which we think about and categorize and engage with people, right? So one of these quotes says, um, I just wanna be a person wearing person clothes. This idea that we shouldn't have to be labeled and categorized and identified on the basis of gender in all of our everyday interactions. Like it's strange that we gender a cashier that we're interacting with for five minutes, that we make all kinds of assumptions about their identity. And if we're using the binary view, on the binary view, you start off looking at someone's appearance. From appearance, you classify their gender. And again, remembering the way the binary view works, once you know their gender, you're gonna know their genitalia, you're gonna know their biological sex. So we start off from this idea of you can look at someone's appearance and from that, you'll have information about their genitals. It's weird that we think that this is a really important piece of information to have in our daily lives as we are navigating the world. That's creepy and strange. Why is that information that other random strangers need to have? Now, it might be really important information for, oh, people with whom one has intimate relationships in their life to have, right? You might need to know, oh, sort of the configuration of a sexual partner's genitalia in order to know best how to like, oh, construct mutually pleasurable and satisfying sexual experiences. That seems reasonable. It might be reasonable for a doctor to need to have information about one's genitalia, or if you're a little child, and for one's parents or caretakers to have some of that information and just like check in on one's like physical health and well-being. But it's deeply creepy and weird for your teachers to be making presumptions about your genitalia. It is creepy and weird for this to be information that is on your driver's license, that the government is tracking, that you are putting on, or you're required to put on all of these job applications. Um, now it might be useful in order to track uh, whether say a particular employer is discriminating against various um, gender categories. That might be one reason to gather some of that information. That's not always why they're gathering it. It's just information that we presume should be publicly accessible. And it's worth questioning whether that's how we need to organize our social world. Now, sometimes people will say, no, we need that information to be uh, publicly available in order to attend to like 
public safety or something like that. So the government needs to know information about your sex. That's why it's listed on your license um, in case you're ever missing. And so that way they can find you. Well, let's remember for a moment what biological sex is actually describing. It's descri describing something about chromosomes, internal reproductive organs, genitalia, or hormone levels. If you're missing and they're looking for you, knowing that you have XX chromosomes, not going to help anyone find you. If you're missing and they're looking for you, um, knowing your hormone levels, really not going to help with that search. Um, knowing your internal reproductive organs, shockingly not useful. Um, maybe knowing something about your external genitalia might be relevant. In the rare cases when someone else could see your external genitalia, and then it's far more effective to say, where is the naked person, right? Um, there aren't that many other cases where somebody else is gonna know your external genitalia and be able to help find you, right? Um, it's just not clear what public good gathering and making publicly available this information is actually doing. Okay, so we should ask some complicated questions about whether we need to be organizing our social world around sex and gender in the way that we currently do. This is part of what Dembroff is getting at in this text, is that we've organized our world in one way, but it's not the only way we could do it. There are other possibilities. There are other ways that we could be organizing things. And it seems like it's worth thinking about what some of those other possibilities might be. Now, from this point, a very, very, very common next logical step that many, many folks do is say, okay, so we have some concerns about our system of binary gender norms and the ways that it structures our social world. So we should just get rid of gender altogether. No more gender, it's gone, get rid of it, don't like it. I think that this is especially easy for cis folks to say. I think it's especially easy to have this response and especially tempting to have this response if one has lived their whole life being treated as actually having the gender that you actually have. Um, I think it's hard to imagine what it is like to have folks not recognizing your identity to have folks devaluing or dismissing or erasing that identity. And I think it is hard to imagine how important it can be to have systems of social recognition for one's identity. So I think that this move to say, okay, gender has problems, binary gender has problems, let's just get rid of it. It's a very well-intentioned move. It's not obvious that it's the way we want to ultimately be going. Instead, and this is what Dembroff starts to argue, we could start to think about the ways in which we could, first of all, give support, recognition, and validation for a variety of genders. We don't have to be locked into this binary system. We can, again, recognize, support, encourage. We can actually provide real social scaffolding for a variety of identities, as well as decentering the importance of gender. Right. So we might start to think of gender as one dimension of identity, along with lots of other possible dimensions of identity. I sometimes like to think of this in terms of um, an analogy to being a guitar player right, or being a musician, right? For some people, being a musician is a crucially important part of identity, right? And if someone was like, no, you're a, something uh, that's not a musician, you're a, a cook, you're a chef, um, right? That can feel devaluing, that can feel dismissive. And you're like, no, you're not seeing this hugely important dimension of who I am. And it's shitty to continuously have that be erased, right? For some folks, being a musician, crucially important. We shouldn't make everybody be a musician. And it's not the case that being a musician is important for everyone who even plays an instrument, right? We can start to think of gender as inhabiting a role similar to that of being a musician, incredibly important for some people's identities and some people's experiences, but not necessarily important for everyone. And that even within this category of being a musician, some people play the guitar, some people play the drums, 
Some people play a shit ton of different musical instruments and don't have one particular favorite, but like there are different moments and different contexts and different crowds where, yeah, sometimes I'm gonna go for the banjo and sometimes I'm going for the saxophone, right? Um, we might start to recognize gender as having this kind of radical, radically inclusive potential that we could view it as something that has, again, an important dimension or important role in some people's lives and experiences, that it can be one dimension amongst others in other people's lives and experiences, and that it might not be some part of some people's identities at all. Right? So we can start to rethink the primacy of gender in our social and political world and in our interactions with one another. But as we are doing this rethinking, we don't have to go to this step of saying, okay, gender is stupid, abolish gender. Because one of the reasons we don't want to go that route is that this also has the effect of saying, trans folks are wrong and confused and want something that's stupid. Why bother even wanting that? If we hold the belief that gender is something that doesn't matter, um, that shouldn't matter, not just that our ultimate goal is to have a wildly different world, but that right now gender is something that one shouldn't be paying that much attention to. This also implies that trans folks are wrong to be seeking out gender affirmation support. This implies that trans folks are putting all of this effort and struggle and fight into receiving social recognition for basically a pointless project, right? And I don't think that most folks think that that's the way to go. Um, and especially, I don't think that most folks who are suggesting, okay, do away with gender, um, are intending to imply these fairly dismissive and negative things about trans identities. Now, one possibility is to say, okay, get rid of gender for everyone except trans folks. Not a good, no, not, not, not better. Um, then it would be saying that gender is something stupid and bad, but I guess trans people can have it. Um, that is not actually helping in our social world and is just creating a new system of othering and of marginalization. Instead, once again, we can start to think about the ways in which gender might be something that we can recognize, support, provide validation for, but also work to deconstruct and which we can work to make oh, much more expansive and allow for this possibility of change and evolution, fluidity, that one isn't necessarily locked into one rigid gender position for one's entire life. But again, perhaps things will shift and change. Perhaps they won't. Maybe you might find that as you are moving through your life, your understanding of your own gender might shift and evolve, but stay within a particular category. Or you might find that, Gender just isn't your thing. It is not something that really structures how you think of yourself. We wanna allow for, again, a variety of life experiences and a variety of identities. And part of recognizing and validating that variety is that we need to allow genuine social support for that variety of identities and experiences. Sometimes, See another way sometimes people respond to these topics just to say, okay, do whatever you want, right? Like we should not be interfering in people's constructions of their own identity. Yay for a variety of genders. We just shouldn't be wading into this at all. Everyone should be able to do what they want. Moving on, it's no one else's business but your own. Once again, I think that this is often very well-intentioned. It's not gonna do what people often think that it might do. If we say, okay, do whatever you want. It's no one's business but your own. That puts all of the burden just on individuals. It doesn't do anything to actually reshape our social world. It means that we'd be leaving all of those binary heteronormative norms in place. All of those practices of, okay, maybe you're not required to have a gender reveal party, but it's pretty normal. It's not calling for, oh, rethinking our systems of architecture and the fact that we have bathrooms for men and for women, and usually that's it. Um, if all we say is, yeah, yay for a variety of genders, do your own thing, it's no, one bus no one's business but your own, we're not actually changing anything. Instead, it's just a new kind of dismissal and erasure of anyone who doesn't have an already recognized and supported gender identity. Um, instead, it's just reinforcing what we've currently got right now. If we do think that it is important to recognize and support a plurality of identities, then we need to do things that actually serve 
to recognize and support that plurality or that variety of identities. And that includes things like having a variety of social practices that give recognition to those possible identities, that we start having a practice of not presuming that we can figure out what somebody's gender is from their appearance, but instead saying, oh, hi, um, my name is Cassie Herbert. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, what's your name? What are your pronouns? How should I refer to you? Um, right? So we might want to start building in space for people to communicate as much or as little of their own information about their own identity as they might want, rather than assuming that we can read it off of somebody's appearance, as well as building in space for people not to disclose uh, that kind of information because we shouldn't be demanding it in the first place, right? Uh, and so there are many different ways that we could be organizing our social world. And I encourage us all to start to think about some of the other possibilities, right? What we might want to alter and change and what new options might be opened up by some of those changes.